books which are universally acclaimed, universally discussed, and universally criticized. Her fictional works, beginning with The Woman's Room, are considered some of the most influential of the modern feminist movement. Ms. French also embodies the bold, courageous spirit of feminism at its best. Erudite, tough, uncompromising, and above all honest, she excels in exposing patriarchy in all its devastating forms. And whether you love or hate her books and her message, anyone who has taken the time to read what she has to say can attest to the fact that she is never dull or duplicitous. She, as we used to say, tells it like it is. Whether she is describing the emotional and spiritual desert of suburban middle-class matrons, the ecstasies of physical and emotional love, or the wider implications of the institutionalized subjugation of women from the first through the third worlds, you know you are dealing with a powerful force. And Ms. French is not just an armchair feminist. She knows whereof she speaks. Ms. French was born in Brooklyn, New York, the eldest of two daughters. She developed a love of books at an early age and started writing poems and stories at the age of 10. Her love of literature took her to Hofstra College in New York, where she majored in philosophy and English literature. A year before graduation, she married Robert French, whom she put through law school by working at what she describes as, quote, a long series of paralyzing office jobs, unquote. I think most of us here know about those. In addition, to supporting her husband's career and working as principal breadwinner and homemaker, she also gave birth to two children. Throughout the 1950s, she devoted her time to her husband and her family, laying aside her aspirations to become a writer. However, in 1957, inspired by Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, she again turned to writing. By the early 1960s, she had returned to Hofstra for a master's degree and where she also taught English. During this period, she wrote two novels, which unfortunately were not published. She was divorced in 1967 and in 1968 entered Harvard University on a full scholarship. Ms. French received her PhD from Harvard in 1972 based upon her dissertation on James Joyce's style and the role of the narrator in his book Ulysses, which was later published by Harvard University Press. The publication of this book on Joyce was, according to her, a turning point in her career. In 1977, her groundbreaking novel, The Women's Room, was published to wide acclaim. An immediate bestseller, The Women's Room sold more than four million copies and has been translated into 20 languages. In 1980, the book was made into a television movie, but I'll come back to that later. Now to discuss the history of the feminist movement, which I'm going to do tonight, would take far more time than I have right now. But let me briefly attempt to sketch some of the highlights of this long and continuing struggle. Now before I begin, let me first apologize to the many non-American women here tonight. I know that the feminist movement is in no way exclusively American. The contributions and struggles of countless women to secure the vote, equal rights, better health care, and more recently an environmentally safe world were and remain a major contribution to the advancement of women. Indeed, women everywhere, in Holland, in India, in Asia, in Africa, have fought, marched, gone to jail, and sacrificed to make the world a better place for themselves and for those who follow. So if I focus on the American feminist movement, it is not because I do not recognize those achievements, but because of the constraints of time. Women's struggles for equal rights in the United States began with the birth of the nation. It is not a well-known fact, but many European women came to the United States as indentured servants, sold from London prisons or kidnapped on the streets. After seven years' servitude, they were freed but given no money at all to survive. Of course, as we all well know, African-American women were brought to America as slaves and were not given their quote-unquote freedom until almost the end of the Civil War. Before 1820, there was no institutionalized education for most women. In fact, in 1819, a woman called Emma Willard 
petitioned the New York State Legislature for the establishment of a women's seminary. Now, she didn't lobby publicly as we know it today, because in those days to lobby, to go directly to your representative, was considered unladylike. The first college to admit women, and I might add African Americans, as well as men, was Oberlin College. In doing this research, I found out something fascinating, which I have to tell you. At first, the tasks that these women were forced to do, were, were expected to do, while so-called students, was far different from what is expected from young female college students today. In addition to their studies, they were required to wash their male colleagues' clothes, clean their rooms, I'm serious, wait on, wait on them at table, and to listen to their course presentations. All tasks thought to be excellent preparation for, what, for a woman's primary duty as housewife and mother. It was not until 1841 that the first women graduated from the regular, and you can read men's, program at, er at Oberlin. Throughout the 19th century, women made incremental gains in education and secured passage of laws giving married women the right to own property. However, it was the abolitionist movement that gave women in numbers their first taste of political activism and helped spur the growth of the women's liberation movements that sprang up in the middle of the 19th century. Refused seats at the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, women were made painfully aware of their second-class status. This experience led to the first meeting of the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. This group was run mostly by married women who participated after finishing their daily chores. And of course, this movement was met with strong criticism across the entire United States. But this period also produced three of the most enduring leaders of the women's movement. Gifted orator Lucy Stone, program writer and philosopher Elizabeth Stanton, and organizer Susan B. Anthony. Another woman who fought valiantly for both abolition and women's rights was the former slave Sojourner, Sojourner Tooth, whose eloquent words inspired many women, black and white. The latter half of the 19th century saw some gains in the women's movement, especially during and after the Civil War. Because men were at war, women were used as teachers, worked in factories, kept the farms going, and nursed the wounded and the dying. In the western part of America, where women had for a long time worked beside their husbands on the farm to survive, women successfully gained the right to own and control their property and money. At the same time, the number of women working in factories increased with the vast industrialization that continued after the Civil War. This trend would continue throughout the 19th century up to today. The organizations that sprang up as a result of the Industrial Revolution were varied, running from Stanton and Anthony's National Women's Suffrage Association, which advocated immediate suffrage, to Lucy Stone's more moderate American Women's Suffrage Association. All of these women had as their basic goal the betterment of the lives of women. And let us not forget the contributions of another 19th century movement which contributed to the organization of women, the women's temperance movement. The 20th century has seen setbacks as well as gains in the movement. The two world wars, as did the Civil War, created countless new opportunities for women as men went to war. And in between the wars, the depression of the 1930s fo forced those lucky enough to find jobs into the workforce, mostly to keep their families alive. Another major force during the 30s was the union movement, which unfortunately excluded most women because they were unskilled. American unions, the first unions, were for skilled workers only. However, undaunted in the face of this discrimination, women managed to organize themselves into the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, who between them counted more than 125,000 members. After the heady independence of women workers during World War II, the end of the war meant that women were expected to go back to their kitchens and making life comfortable for their returning men. In addition, the anti-communist red hunting rhetoric of the 1950s had no room for social activists of any kind, especially not female social activists. As one author put it so succinctly, and I quote, in the 1950s, the 1950s were an apolitical period. Idealism or concern with social problems was considered rather weird. 
Men learned that the highest virtue was money making. Women were told that the highest virtue was to be a child producing machine surrounded by lots of glittering gadgets in a little box in the suburbs. And sex was glorified since there was nothing else exciting left to glorify." Unquote. <laughs> However, this ideal American family was in reality becoming more and more of a myth as increasing numbers of American women entered the workforce in order to maintain minimum living standards for their family. After the relative dearth of organized women activists from the 1920s through the 1950s, the 1960s saw another resurgence of activism. Growing along with the civil rights and student activist movements, American women again took to the streets and to the ballot box in defense of their cause. And although President John Kennedy established the Commission on the Status of Women in 1961, with Esther Peterson, I think some of you know, as its chair, much credit for this resurgence in, is given to Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963, which provided a powerful indictment of the ideology that forced women into the role of full-time housewife and described the psychological costs of that life. One of the most active women's organizations established during this time was the National Organization for Women, or NOW. Established in 1966, its stated purpose was to take action to bring women into full participation in the mainstream of American society now, exercising all the privileges and responsibilities thereof in truly equal partnership with men. Now, I could go on and on and on and on, but you all will drag me off the stage. So let me say that all of these people and organizations I have discussed are just a few of the countless contributors to the women's movement. The women who marched and are still marching those who wrote and are still writing, have shaped our paths and hold our collective future. Nowhere has this been more evident than in the literary world. From the six-page Voices of the Women's Liberation Movement, started by feminists in Chicago in the mid-60s, to feminist printing companies, from women who have given us the women's survival catalog and books like Our Bodies, Ourselves, women have always recognized the importance of print in spreading their messages to wider audiences. Which brings me back, finally, to Ms. French and the women's room. I remember little of the circumstances which prompted me to buy her book. I think I picked it up in the bookstore because I thought, who has written a book about the bathroom? <laughs> so I thought, hmm. But all I know is that once re I read that book, I have never been the same. This book, which many describe as a collective biography of an entire generation of women, chronicles the lives of Mira, Mira Ward and her friends, who transformed themselves from submissive, submissive housewives in the 1950s into independent women of the 1970s. Her next novel, The Bleeding Heart, concerns the affair between a married American businessman and the divorced American professor with whom he has a turbulent affair, and the professor's inability to reconcile her need for emotional closeness with her requirement for independence and intellectual freedom. Her third novel, Her Mother's Daughter, follows the lives of four generations of women in a Polish-American family. The middle-class photographer daughter, who narrates the story, exquisitely recounts the pattern of sacrifice, grief, and bitterness experienced by her mother and her grandmother, and which is so similar to that of her own life and in the lives of her daughters. Not to be content with writing fiction, Ms. French carries her worldview into the realm of nonfiction as well. Her 1981 work, Shakespeare's Division of Experience, illuminates the origins of male-dominated society and the ways in which patriarchal values are perpetuated. Her next nonfiction work, Beyond Power, on Women, Men, and Morals, published in 1985, further developed her theories of the connection between gender-based differences and the adoption of a morality that glorifies the masculine principle of dominance. Her next nonfiction work, The War Against Women, further expands her earlier theories and presents a devastating case for the revival of the feminist movement. Crossing the globe, The War Against Women catalogs the harm done to women in the name of fundamentalist religions and cultural customs, including genital mutilation in Africa, bride burning in India, murder of girl babies in China, sexual discrimination and harassment in government and business, and rape and domestic violence. 
Although one critic described her book by saying that it, quote, at time reads like a field report from the seventh circle of hell, unquote, no one can dispute the enormous work and knowledge that went into the writing of the book, nor can anyone dismiss its equally enormous impact on readers throughout the world. As Gloria Steinem said, and I quote, if you can read only one book about what's wrong with this country, speaking of America, or give only one book to someone who thinks women are a single issue, the war against women is it, unquote. Which brings me to Ms. French's latest book, Our Father. Four daughters, each with different mothers, gather at the home of their well-to-do, charming, and famous father. The relationship of the four women to each other and their father is at first superficial and largely negative, representing four diff completely different lifestyles, from Elizabeth, the Washington super bureaucrat, to Ronnie, the half-Mexican offspring of the father and the housemaid, to Alex, the suburban housewife, who at one point in the book likens herself to a blade of grass, to Mary, the wickedly bitchy socialite. These women appear to have nothing at all in common. However, as defenses come down and truths are told, the women discover a horrifying common bond, the systematic rape of all four by their father. Without giving away too much of the story, these women travel from mutual suspicion and disdain to love, nurturing, mutual support, and finally, I think, hope. Explosive, cruel, funny, disturbing, and finally deeply redemptive and moving, this book is a masterpiece of literature, as well as a moving example of the triumph of human spirit and sisterly love over violence, oppression, and humiliation. The mother of one of the characters repeats to her daughter throughout the book, to live is to love. At first, I didn't understand her words. So caught up was I in the indignation and bitterness of the four women's abuse at the hands of their father. However, by the end of the book, I think I understood what she had tried to instill in her daughter. And that is that no matter what, love is what guides and sustains us. No matter what, love is what makes us unique. And no matter what, love is what's truly important in this world. I have learned so much from Ms. French and her writings that I would be here for days discussing how a phrase or a paragraph made me throw the book down in rage, shed a tear of despair, or shake my head in pride and wonder at the diversity, strength, and beauty that we as women all share. Indeed, that we as people all share. But that's not what you came here to hear tonight. So, let me end with a quote from a speech by Elizabeth Candy Stanton, which she made at a meeting of the International Council of Women in 1888. And it begins, we feel a peculiar tenderness for the young women on whose shoulders we are about to leave our burdens. Although we have opened a pathway to the promised land and cleared up much of the underbrush of false sentiment, logic, and rhetoric intertwisted with law and custom, which blocked all avenues in starting, yet there are still many obstacles to be encountered before the rough journey is ended. The younger women are starting with great advantages over us. They have the results of our experience. They have superior opportunities for education. They will find a more enlightened public sentiment for discussion. They will have more courage to take the rights which belong to them. Hence, we may look to them for speedy conquests. When we think of the vantage ground women hold today, woman holds today, excuse me, in spite of all the artificial obstacles placed in her way, we are filled with wonder as to what the future mothers of the race will be when free to have complete development. Thus far, women have been the mere echoes of men. Our laws and constitutions, our creeds and codes, and the customs of social life are all of masculine origin. The true woman is as yet a dream of the future." End quote. I believe that the woman of the future Miss Stanton talked about is here, now, in all of us. And I sincerely believe that no one better articulates the joys, sorrows, dreams, and struggles of us, these women, than the woman I have the great honor to present to you now. Ms. Marilyn French, thank you. Thank you.
very much, Cynthia. That was very nice. I'm going to talk to you tonight a little bit about writing Our Father, a process that took a bit of a time. My new novel, Our Father, took a long time to come into being. After I published Beyond Power in 1984, my agent, Charlotte Sheedy, suggested using a chapter from that book as the basis for a television series. Because women are omitted from traditional histories, there's a very famous history of the world, for instance, that does not even mention Elizabeth I of England. Because women are omitted from traditional histories, she longed to see a history of women presented on television. I agreed to help her in this enterprise, and we began meeting with producers and television executives. But no American production company or network was interested, not even PBS. The Civil War, yes. Women's struggle, no. Eventually, however, the education department of Tim's a British production company, expressed interest in the project. They agreed to produce a 10-part television documentary on the history of women across the globe, from the beginning of human life to the present. We signed a contract with them. The agreement included a 500-page book, which I would write, for a popular audience to accompany the television series. In 1985, I finished Her Mother's Daughter, at the time, I had an idea for another novel about enmity between sisters. But I had to wait to write it. I had to work on the history book. That was all right, I reasoned. The novel was vague in my mind. I'd just as well let it develop on its own, a process I call mulching. Besides, I thought, the history would be done in a year. A year later, I was still stuck in prehistory <laughs> and the rise of the state. Many professional historians helped me, providing me with their research and bibliographies for my own, but I had to do far more research than I imagined. In the end, the history book took me years, and in the intervening time, the television program was canceled. Margaret Thatcher had decreed that British television should become more like that a wonderful phenomenon, American television. <laughs> should become self-supporting, paid for by commercials. In the process of becoming more commercial, British television companies canceled many educational pro projects and Thames gutted its education section. They were the ones who were supposed to produce this thing. But by then, I was too deeply engaged in the history and had already invested too much time and money in it to abandon it. So I went slogging on and the new novel went unwritten. But it kept mulching. As I worked on the history, the novel would come to me in bed as I drifted or failed to drift off to sleep. For my original idea of warring sisters, I had intended to allude to or used metaphorically historical events from the power struggle of Queen Elizabeth I with Mary, Queen of Scots, and refer also to Bloody Mary, Elizabeth's half-sister, Mary Tudor. The novel would be about sibling hatred, but would also, I hoped, get at some of the problems of feminism. At that time, this is mid-80s, Many feminists were lamenting the loss of solidarity, the easy communality of the early days of the second wave of feminism. The days of consciousness raising groups and open militants, I don't know if you had them here, but it was a very joyful time in the United States. Journalists perceiving chinks in feminist unity were using them to attack or belittle the movement. No one expects all men to support each other and espouse identical opinions. 
But if groups fighting for a voice in society, like women or blacks, do not hew a party line, they risk being seen as fragmented, collapsing, passe. Indeed, the term post-feminist began to appear in print. I thought, have I died already? <laughs> As time went on, the novel grew and changed considerably in my mind. At some time or other, somehow or other, it had become entwined with a novel which affected me probably more deeply than any other book I've ever read, Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. At 18, I had loved this book loved its scope and profundity. I was awed by Dostoevsky's daring in questioning the existence of God, a ponderous subject to treat in a fictional work, and in imagining what might happen if Christ came back to earth, and most audacious, to write a parable depicting a high church official dismissing him, the famous segment nicknamed the Grand Inquisitor. I loved Dostoevsky's character, Ivan, who reminded me of myself. He's a tormented naysayer. Like me, Ivan said no to facile sentiment, shunned his culture's pieties, challenged its hypocrisy. Like me, he was made ill by humanity's pitiless cruelty. I loved Ivan for his visions, his nightmares, and his pain at human behavior, a pain I felt must reflect Dostoevsky's. Of course, Ivan goes mad, but he was fictional. <laughs> I was alive and I intended to stay sane. But even then, I loved the book, This Side Idolatry, as Ben Jonson said of Shakespeare. Being like Ivan, I had to question Dostoevsky's pieties, like the unfailing and unbelievable, as far as I'm concerned, saintliness and lack of ego of Father Zosima and Alexei. Dostoevsky's hostile depictions of women distressed me. I read the book long before feminists began to point out that even the most exalted male authors saw women through highly distorted lenses, if they saw them at all. The women in the Brothers Karamazov function mainly as men's motivations, poles in male experience, so their own motivations are often opaque or mysterious. They're very different from each other, yet all are depicted with something less than respect, something close to scorn. But above all, I questioned one of the book's major assumptions. The climax of the novel is a trial scene. Dmitri, the eldest Karamazov brother, is put on trial for murdering his father, although it's not clear he's guilty. The prosecutor, Ippolit Kirillovich, admits that Fyodor Karamazov, the father, is utterly and completely vile. He has not one redeeming characteristic, not one virtue. Nevertheless, Ippolit condemns his murder not because Fyodor Karamazov is a human being and killing any human being is a wrong, but because Fyodor was a father. All Europe is watching, he claims, as corrupt, depraved Russian sons rise up against their fathers. Dostoevsky was, of course, very political in talking about the political situation of his time. He was also very religious. And once God is dead, oh, I left out a sentence. One tacit moral premise of the novel is that the father is God's surrogate on earth. To kill a father is tantamount to killing God. And once God is dead, Everything is permitted, as Ivan, driven mad by torment, teaches Smerdyakov, the bastard brother, the others hold responsible for their father's murder. At 18, 
These assumptions worried me as silently and nearly invisibly as a brow wrinkles. I'd already read Aeschylus's Eumenides and knew that he and other Greeks, like Aristotle, considered the murder of a father far more serious than the murder of a mother. But the Greeks gave a different reason for this phenomenon. But then, fathers were the true parents of children. Mothers were merely vessels that carried the father's creation. I was a mother's child, but I couldn't challenge such assertions. I didn't know how. They fell into the pool of my mind to swim around for a couple of decades, developing pearls by abrasion. Finally, Dostoevsky's presentation of the Karamazov brothers seemed to me to be false, which wouldn't have mattered if I hadn't so admired him. The author portrays the bastard half-brother as amoral or vilely immoral, seemingly only because he's a bastard, which I felt was hardly his fault. Nor does bastardy comprise character. Dostoevsky also seemed to me to idealize the three legitimate brothers. They don't know each other. The offspring of two different mothers, they haven't been brought up together but separately and they meet when they're adults. Yet they show unfailing love and generosity towards each other. They maintain this tone throughout a period of great crisis filled with elements that would tear even close friends or relatives apart. I have never met brothers or sisters like this. I've never met siblings who offered each other such largesse, except in fictions like Little Women or Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> and even there, only one or at the most two, not all of the siblings, are good-hearted and generous. In life, siblings tend to harbor considerable jealousy and animus for each other. Even those who like, even those who love each other, must continually suppress little springs of the residue of ancient infant rivalry, which may spill out under pressure. Although I had not read the Brothers Karamazov for years, it gradually entwined itself with my novel. In 1985, I called the novel, or rather the set of ideas swirling around in my head, I called it The Sisters. By 1987, I was calling it the Sisters K. And there were four sisters, not two, and one was a bastard. Among the elements swirling around in my imagination was the question of what it would mean to a daughter to have a father who thinks he is God's surrogate. My father is a mild man, but many of my childhood girlfriends had tyrannical fathers who were verbally physically and sometimes sexually brutal. I saw bruises, strap marks, and cowering fear. I listened to whispered confessions. In my youth, I was young a long time ago, children simply accepted paternal power as a fact, shrinking in fear, but never challenging it. I was able to question it because I never had to fear it. Was it right that people should have such power? Did they use it to benefit their daughters, their sons, their wives? I wanted to let these questions play themselves out in a novel. The third element that braided itself into the novel that became Our Father is the feminist vision itself. Those of us who were part of feminist communities in the 60s and 70s worked at maintaining cooperative, harmonious relations with each other. For example, in 1975, a friend and I, the only overt feminists on the faculty of a small northern college, realized we were up for tenure at the same time. We met for drinks and discussion. We knew we were better qualified than anyone, any man up for tenure, and we were quite better qualified than most of the tenured faculty. We had both published books, only one man on the faculty had done that. 
But we also knew that the misogynistic administration would not tolerate the permanent presence of two unabashed feminists. We were sure that one of us would be sacrificed. It was just a question of which one. We vowed to remember who the enemy was and that it was not the other. We gave each other courage and understanding throughout the year and were able to remain friends once that year was over and our prediction had indeed been realized. We're friends still. Feminists still try to un emphasize understanding and rapport, especially with close friends. But this is often a struggle against external and internal pressures, and I sometimes wondered if we were lying to each other and ourselves, if we were willfully creating our own web of pious hypocrisies to make ourselves feel good. Some serious thinkers, some of them feminists, deny that human society was ever cooperative, as some archaeologists, anthropologists, and historians suggest. Such thinkers would never use the word evil. They would never quote from the book of Genesis God's words to Noah, you remember them, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, words that I'm sure have been uttered in this building at some time. <laughs> But they seem to believe that violence and hatred, rivalry and greed, are not just part of the human psyche, which I think we would all agree they are, but the dominant part. Moreover, the sweet harmony of the feminist vision makes it easy to mock as Pollyanna-ish, especially for skeptical naysayers and those who dislike what my character Elizabeth calls the dictatorship of niceness among women. Any vision of harmony is suspect in a hard, cynical age. I wanted to let my characters think, feel, and act on all this and see what they came up with. Then, in the fall of 1989 or 1990, I can't remember which, Gloria Steinem called the writer Esther Broner, the television journalist Carol Jenkins, and me together and invited us to dinner to discuss forming a group devoted to celebrating feminist occasions and to give each other affection and courage. We formed a coven, and this book is dedicated to them. We became a girl gang, the nucleus of a floating party. Since then, we have met formally four times a year at solstices and equinoxes, those are our holy occasions, and informally at other times. At our formal dinner meetings, we try to strengthen and hearten each other with understanding, sympathy, vision, magic, and the power of will. I always leave those evenings feeling burnished and light at heart which is a rarity for me. They're among the most loving events of my life. I finally finished a third draft of the history book, which I refer to privately as the monster. <laughs> it was then 3,000 pages long. In the fall of 1991, exhausted, I immediately began to write Our Father as a relief. The writing went swiftly because I'd thought about it for almost 10 years. But before I was finished, I was diagnosed with a serious illness. My doctors held out little chance of survival. And wanting to finish the novel before I died, I bought a laptop computer so I could work in the hospital during treatments. My family and friends, however, did not accept the doctor's prediction. My children, my coven, and a host of other friends surrounded me. They would not let me follow my natural inclination towards solitude. They would not leave me alone. 
They brought me food I often could not eat and clothes to fit around the ivy lines in my arms and teddy bears and books about healing and meditation tapes and a portable CD player and boxes of Mozart and Billie Holiday CDs <laughs> and magical amulets and crystals and stones and clay hands and a Zuni fetish and a Cherokee talisman a leather pendant bag filled with sweet-smelling herbs from a sweat lodge ceremony held partly in my name. <laughs> One coven sister used the credit her rabbi ancestors had saved up with Yahweh to petition for my reprieve. She wrote out a formal petition and had it notarized. When I was too sick to go out, the coven held meetings in my hospital rooms, complete with magic wands, eagle feathers, and embraces. The doctors still regard me with suspicion. <laughs> they do not understand what happened, or why, or how I recovered. Yet here I am, against more odds than I care to tell you. Before I nearly died, I had finished a second draft of the novel. Recovering, unable to sit up or walk, I lay on a couch to edit it orally while my assistant Isabel worked the computer. But the novel required no real changes, only some polishing. For myself, I no longer doubted the importance of a loving community. My characters, who functioned independently of me, each interpreted a little differently. But they, too, had decided that a loving community was the most important element in a life. Thank you. Thanks very much. I thought if you'd like, because my speech was a little short for the time that, that was given me, I'd read a little bit to you from our father. Does that suit you? All right. The, the passage that someone suggested I read, I think it's a good one, comes from the very end of the book. The sisters have achieved a kind of harmony with each other, and they have just spent a Christmas day together that is a kind of diamond, a beautiful day, in which they, they just spontaneously, easily pour love on each other, and they all feel that love as it pours over them. Where they are is a great mansion, their father's house, in a town called Lincoln in Massachusetts. Lincoln is a, a suburb of Boston, very wealthy, where there are great big houses hidden behind miles of trees. The year is 1984. The four sisters are together after this almost orgiastic Christmas. Ronnie, the daughter of the Mexican housekeeper, the bastard, the youngest one, the sisters are four different generations. Elizabeth's in her 50s, Mary's in her 40s, Alex is in her 30s, Ronnie's in her 20s. Ronnie is getting a PhD in environmental studies, the youngest one. Alex is a housewife who is going off to build a clinic in El Salvador. Mary is a society woman who is idle and useless but harbors a deep, profound need to write poetry and play the piano. And Elizabeth, the older sister, oldest, is in some sense the dominant one and she's an assistant secretary of the treasury and the government. She's her father's daughter. Her father was a, an important man in the government. He has died, though. This is the end of the Christmas day. They're lying around in the playroom. And Ronnie says, this was one of the best days of my life. Mmm, Mary mumbled. Me too. Oh, me too, Alex said fervently. It's so great when women do things together, Ronnie went on. 
Then she told them about the dinner her friend Linda had given for her. It was the opposite of this, but it was great too. She's a graduate student. She hasn't got two cents. She lives in a dingy apartment. Well, all my friends are poor. They all live like that, but they wanted to celebrate. It's something they do a lot. Me too, when I lived there. And everybody brings something, you know? Pasta, or bean soup, or rice, or beans, or stew, bread, salad, wine, fruit. And we talk, and we laugh, and we eat, and we all help clean up. And there are no zinging egos flying across the room. No pretenses about manliness to bolster. No lies to defend. We just have a great time. Elizabeth's chin changed. Was it jealousy at the fact of all those friends? An implicit challenge in Ronnie's saying that din that dinner had been as fine as this one? The mention of defended lies? The accumulated pleasures of the day lying thick and lardy on an austere heart? Or was it a recognition of some essential difference in her from all the rest of them? Whatever hit her, she was palpably hit. She glared at Ronnie, included the others in the glare, burst into speech. You make me sick with your idealization of femaleness, as if women were morally better than men, as if they had a different nature. What sentimental slop! What a stupid idea to entertain, some sweet little domestic world. Everyone sh sharing, loving, co cooperative, no egos. What a laugh. Who's more competitive than women, I ask you? Weight, shape, clothes, hair, nails, cooking. They work like dogs to buy for men, men, men. And women have such nasty little ways of getting at each other, all the while smiling. Such hypocrisies. At least men pull out weapon weapons and kill each other directly. <laughs> Do you really think if there were only women, if we could reproduce ourselves alone, we'd all be living in some communal paradise? We'd all be living in grass huts, that's what. Line taken straight from Camille Paglia. When she paused to take a drag on her cigarette, Ronnie said calmly, Actually, if you look at the remains of matricentric societies, they lived in considerable luxury and well-being, without war. And even if we did live in grass huts, if we got along and had enough to eat, and the evidence shows we did when we controlled our own lives and our own crops, most of the time at least, it might not be so bad. I mean, compare a grass hut to some of the cribs in Roxbury in the South Bronx. It doesn't look half bad. <laughs> oh, what nonsense, Elizabeth interrupted. War broke out eventually, didn't it? When there were enough people, when there was crowding, it was inevitable. It's part of the beast we are. All this feminist nonsense, it's as bad as Marxism. It asserts, simply asserts, that we are kind, loving, cooperative creatures when every line in every book of history testifies to something else. The commies insisted we were something else. They tried to remake human nature by fiat. Look what it's gotten them. They've created the most oppressive society that ever existed, worse than any oriental tyrant, dictator, emperor. The only way you can build a halfway civilized society is by taking into consideration the fact that we are savage, cruel, competitive, aggressive, predatory animals. We're killers, like the other large mammals. Haven't you heard of survival of the fittest? Well, who do you imagine are the fittest? The most savage, the most efficient killers. And here, I will grant you, men take the prize. And the best you can do is protect yourself against them. But it's inevitable that the weak will be destroyed. They'll be exterminated. It's happening clear across the globe right now. Every primitive society, every simple society is being wiped out. There's nothing you can do about that. It's nature, <clears throat> human nature, and it's inevitable because it's necessary. 
and it has a function, it keeps the human race strong. That's terrible, Alex gasped. You can't be serious, Lizzie. I'm dead serious. You all are a bunch of sentimentalists. You don't know what you're talking about most of the time. Jesus Christ, what kind of a world do you think you live in? You think our little idol in Lincoln is anything but a dream made possible, bought and paid for, by the savagery of our forefathers, who robbed and seized and cheated and bribed and killed sufficiently to realize a little island in the middle of hell. What do you think is going on out there? Constantly, the Prime Minister of India is assassinated. Hijackers killed passengers in the airport at Tehran. A chemical factory explodes in Bhopal. Hundreds of thousands of people are starving to death in Burkina Faso. And that's just the last few weeks. And that doesn't count civil wars in hundreds of places across the globe. El Salvador, that Alex is so passionate about, is hardly the only place. Look at what's going on in Ethiopia, Nicaragua, Chile, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Mozambique, Angola, Jesus, even that only skims the surface. And beyond that, look at what people do to each other on the streets of so-called civilized countries. Murder and mayhem. Even people who love each other or say they do. How many men murder their wives or girlfriends every day? You can't count them. How many if you added them up? Beatings, rapes, torture, murders in all the cities, in the towns, in villages, in the countryside across the world. You don't even need to be invaded by hooligans. Your own father will do the job right inside that idyllic home. Like our father. And if he doesn't, your mother may hit you, or worse. There is no safe place. That's an illusion. There is no security, even though people struggle for it their whole lives long, as if it existed. As if enough money or power or prestige can insulate you. But we know better, don't we? We are constantly besieged, threatened. Life is constant struggle. The best you can do is claw your way to some temporary security, some island like this house, or some academic post. She glanced at Ronnie. And try for dear life to hold on. And beyond that, out there it's the same. Empty space with exploding stars, black holes, planets of methane ice, comets. And now there's a hole in the ozone layer, an acid rain, and God knows what else threatening us. It's a struggle to find enough food, to find drinkable water in most parts of the world. And then you have to avoid provoking your fellow man who may just pull out an Uzi or an AK-47 or whatever the current designer weapon may be. You have to be armed, armed with something, a weapon or money, position, some kind of power, because the name of the game is war, constant war. That's what it is to be alive. She fell back, exhausted, her eyes wild, her hands pulling at her hair, her cigarette out. She stared dully at the wall. The others gazed at her, aghast, and remained silent for a long time. Oh. Poor Lizzie, Alex whispered finally. That's quite a vision, Elizabeth, Ronnie said quietly. It's not a vision, she cried. It's reality. She sat up and lighted a fresh cigarette. Don't you see? Don't you realize? But it's not the only reality, Alex said softly. It's not all of reality. No, Mary murmured. What about all the beauty? The beauty of days, of light, of nature, of cities, of people. What about all the lovely things we gave each other today? 
all the wonderful things we ate, the fun we had. And it's not the only truth about us either, about human beings, Ronnie said stubbornly. We're not all at war with each other. We help each other. Where I come from, it's a world you don't know. No one would survive if the women didn't watch each other's kids, take each other's kids, sometimes for months, for God's sake. They share food. There's always room for one more at the table, even if things are rough. They lend each other stuff, a blanket, a heavy coat, whatever. Listen, I work with nature at the lowest level. Mosses and lichen are called lower plants. They don't have the complexity of large ones. Although some mosses are unisexual and some bisexual, she grinned. Ronnie is gay. But our entire ecology depends on them, among other such species. And lichen, which is probably one of the first forms of life to appear on Earth and which is thus fundamental to other life, is symbiotic. It's made up of two different species that need each other to exist. It survives by cooperating, not conflict. It can live where nothing else can live, in the highest mountain where nothing else grows, at the edges of oceans, at the very top of the highest tropical trees where the sun blazes too strongly for any other plant. It even lives at the bottom of those trees where the climate's too dark or wet for other plants. And it's a frontier plant. It makes soil, one of the few species that do. It creates. And much of nature works this way. If you want to talk about the nature that's in us and from which we arise, you should think about how the nature outside us works. You know, some botanists, Guys. The guys are always looking for signs of domination in nature. They tried to make out that the fungi are dominant in lichen because they're more conspicuous and have greater volume. But they concluded that the fungi are utterly dependent on the algae, maybe even more dependent on the algae than the algae are on them. There's no comparison between them in terms of power, fame, Wealth, you can't even discuss them in the same breath. But I doubt that if your father had died first, my mother would have had a stroke, assuming she wasn't already dead. My mother seemed to be completely dependent on your father, but the truth was otherwise. She paused, lighted a cigarette, continued in a calmer voice. Your vision is a male vision, a capitalist vision. Well, I suppose today's communists have it too. It's the vision that justified the changes in economic structure from feudalism to industrialization. It's, it's taught to us to keep us in line. But it isn't necessarily the truth about human nature. They want us to believe it, so we'll go on fighting their wars and dying for them. To dying to bolster their power so they can increase their wealth, and they only give the dead medals. You have to go believe this stuff to go so you can go on working for that administration, go on believing in the economic principles you learned in school. You have to believe it to justify your life, but we don't. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be a very short intermission. Thank you very much, Ms. French and Cynthia Bunton. There will be a very short intermission so we don't lose too much time for the second half of the program. She prefers direct interaction with the audience. So I would invite you now to raise your hands if you have a question. And as I said, either come up or Woman in this room. 
you stand online. Get online behind the microphone if you want to ask a question. Then we'll get more we'll get to more questions. So I would really like to know what you think of her and of her um, way of performing science. And then the other one is, um, what do you think of women's studies and how it could change the atmospheres in universities between male and female students and professors? The atmosphere and the relations between male and female students. <laughs> So until those kinds of invidious distinctions go, we're going to have to have women's studies courses. Right. How you change the attitude of men, I don't know. I've taught women in literature courses, and I've had male students. But I think that any boy, they are only boys and girls at that point, any boy who comes into a class like that is already halfway there, because my male students were always really sweet <laughs> and lovely. But I think you know it was a pre-selected audience because most of the, the men that you wouldn't care to talk to would not have entered a course like that. Right. So I don't know what you do. Uh, you know, being nice doesn't help, and being nasty doesn't help. <laughs> I used to say, you just have to wait for all the old men to die, but they've all died. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. 
can't answer that one. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thank you very much. Excuse me, we can't hear you very well up here. Oh, really? <laughs> it doesn't. Oh, okay. Um, I'm speaking away from the microphone. That's probably the trouble. Do you mind if I pull oh, it no, over? No, no, go right ahead. Nobody wants to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> of course we do, so. <laughs> yes. Hello, my name's Chris, and I want to ask you something. You spoke about your um, inspiration taken from the brothers Karamazov. You spoke about the father as a substitute um, of God on earth, and therefore the mother on the father being even worse. Um, what I wonder is how important for your ambitions, for your development of your ambitions, and for the fulfillment of your ambitions, was the fact that you came from a family with only two daughters, the fact that your, our father, was a daughter's father. And in how far would, it, would I be able to read between the lines, um, maybe especially in the character Elizabeth, um, a daughter of such a family? I'm not sure I understand the second part of your question. I think I understand the first part. As, as I mentioned in my speech, I said I think that I could see uh, the way things were from the outside because they weren't that way for me. My mother was dominant in our home. And I, and I know that my father had a brutal upbringing. It's a very interesting thing to me. I have known a lot of men who had brutal upbringings and the way they justify it. I find really pathetic. I remember once when my mother was still alive, I was planning to write her mother's daughter and I was asking them questions, writing down the answers. And I was asking them what are the first things they remembered. My father had no memories of his childhood, except uh, all the things he invented. But you know, he was already nine or so years old when he started to invent things. And children, I have memories that go back to three. So I said, well, what about when you were very young? What do you remember? And he couldn't remember. He said, and he said well, you know, my father, uh, well, he hit me with the belt a few times, but I'm sure I deserved it. <laughs> and my mother said, oh, really? You must have done something awful, Eddie, three years old. <laughs> but he deserved it. That's what he thinks. Anyway, he was not allowed to treat us that way. My mother wouldn't let him. So we grew up. I mean, my, my friends did not believe when I would tell them, because I did things that were not so good. And I would say to my friend, I did thus and such, oh, did you get a whipping? I'd say, no. Oh, you're lying. But I, I, it wasn't. I mean, we also were not exposed to rage. We were not exposed to bigotry. I mean, my mother was very very large woman in her heart, um, generous woman. So I think I saw almost everything from in the outside world as a stranger. I certainly did not know what it meant to be a woman. I had to learn. I had no idea what that meant. When I got married and had children, I did research in the neighborhood. I did. I invited everybody in for coffee, and I interviewed them. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ms. French. My name is Myra Jacob. I've uh, followed the relationships in your books between men and women uh, in the women's room, the bleeding heart, also her mother's daughter. My first question, I have two, is what do you think, what is your opinion of the institution of marriage today? stop thinking of marriage as ownership of women, it will be wonderful. That's all I have to say. <laughs> okay. The second question is, what is your vision of the ideal relationship between a man and a woman in a love relationship? It's the same as my notion of friendship, except it involves sex. Um, The, the most important thing in any relationship is the freedom to be yourself. 
You have to be able to be who you are, to say what you think without fear. Mm -hmm. That's why any relationship based on a power differential is poisoned from the root. If one person is dependent on the other, financially or emotionally, totally, I mean, if it's all one way, then one always fears loss of the other and one can never be honest. One is always trying to please the other. In a decent relationship, there's going to be a little fear on both sides because each is dependent on the other. There's going to be a little fear of losing the other. But if it's founded on really being able to be yourself and loving the other one for being themselves, then it's a great relationship that makes both people stronger. Thank you very much. Hello, Ms. French. I'd like to know why you wrote the book of power. I'd also like to know your opinions on what's happening today with the New World Order and what's happening in Europe in relationship to what you've been writing. In relationship to what? What you've been writing. When you wrote on power, the, the you did The book Beyond Power is yes. what you're talking about. Yes. Actually, I, I, Beyond Power is a sort of typical book for me. I started it, I thought it would be 35 pages long. Five years later, it was a 900-page manuscript. It was uh, everywhere I went to give speeches, women would ask me the same question. How did things get like this? How did they get so uneven? How did it happen that men voted themselves all the property? How did we let them get away with that? How did we end up poor and they end up rich? How did this all come about? And I knew the answer. But I couldn't say it from a podium because it was too long and too complicated. So I thought I'll write a 35-page essay and publish it somewhere. So I wrote it, and I wrote it, and I wrote it. And it got to be a couple of hundred pages. And I said to Jim, my publisher, I think this is a book. And I gave it to him. He said, Marilyn, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, oh, <laughs> you're going to make me do it the hard way and say it all. So I had to say it all five years later, beyond power is the book that came out, which is an analysis of how patriarchy arose, how we came to entertain the values we, we presently hold, and what they do to us. That's what I wanted the book to show. What has happened in the years since I wrote it has, was already underway when I was writing it. All of those power differentials have grown enormously. Uh, we know that most manufacturing jobs within the next 20, 30 years are going to be removed from Western Europe and the United States, are going to be placed in uh, South, the South Pacific, in Southeast Asia, in India, and if uh, South Africa becomes stable in South Africa, where people can still be paid in Mexico and some South American countries, where women, it's mostly women who are hired for the underlying jobs, they're paid a few cents an hour. There are no labor laws. There are no environmental laws. And what's going to happen in Western Europe and the United States is there's going to be a very small class of very, very rich people and a large class of people working for McDonald's. <laughs> That's what's happening. I'd like your impression on two terms, the New World Order and ethnic cleansing. The New World Order and what? Ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing. Yeah, what do you want me to do about those two terms? I'd like to you give me your impression on them. Would I? Your what? impression. He wants your impression on those two. The New World Order, I have no idea what that is. Uh, I thought it was just something George Bush put in a speech. Uh, the New World <laughs> Order started a long time ago. It started in the 50s and 60s when Africa uh, overthrew colonialism. And we sent in all these nice charitable agencies that taught Africans to raise cash crops. And we created a global economy based on cash and, of course, oil. Uh, that's when the New World Order started. And it's global, and it's economic, and it is wiping out, as Elizabeth mentions in her in infuriated address, it is wiping out indigenous peoples everywhere in the world. It's killing them. It's murdering them. Um, ethnic cleansing, we all know what that is. You, uh, you know, the word purity. I remember once I went to Germany, it was many, many years ago, and I met with some German feminists. And we had a kind of uh, brutal talk. 
because they attacked me because I had anything to do with men. I had written a book in which not everybody was a lesbian. There was only one lesbian. Uh, the rest of the women had dealings with men, and this was not supposed to be permitted. I said, oh. They said, no, it's not ideologically pure. I said, the word purity should be reserved for butter, milk, and such things. <laughs> Nothing else. That's what I have to say about ethnic cleansing. Sure, sorry. I don't think I looked up there. You know, I didn't realize you yeah. were all up there. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. something. <laughs> I wanted her, I wanted to try to deal with women of different ages, di different sexual persuasions, different religious persuasions, and to whatever degree I could, different colors. Now that's hard because I haven't the experience of being another color. I can imagine being another color, but I've never been another color. Mexican seemed possible to me. It was possible that a Stephen Upton could have a Mexican cook. It was less likely that he would have a black cook, given what he was and where he came from. Um, I don't think he would have an Oriental cook, although he might have an Oriental manservant. But he doesn't have a manservant. It just seemed the most likely. Uh, and that's right. That's it. that's the only reason. It just seemed the most possible, most realistic. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I have a written question, and I'll just I'll write. I'll read it very, very quickly. Um, Ms. French, to try to make a difference in women's lives, I send subscriptions to Ms. to my feminist grandmother, my sexist father, and my closest friends. I've marched in Washington. I've donated money to Now and W A R A L. I think. Narrow. N narrow. Narrow. In. Okay. In my work as a teacher and in my personal life, my feminism plays an open and important role in my interactions with people. But after reading your book, The War Against Women, and listening to Alice Walker speak about the horrors of female genital mutilation, I can't help wondering, to steal a line from Peggy Lee, is that all there is to feminism? With all the crimes being committed against women the world over, am I really doing enough to justify considering myself a feminist? P.S. Has the woman's room ever been made into a musical? <laughs> I love this question. Great question. Whoever wrote that, would you like to stand up and take a round of applause? Yes. <laughs> Great question. Where is she? Here she is, right there. She's up there. Um, you know, the thing about feminism is, it's an ideology, if you like. I prefer to call it a philosophy. Some people call it an ideology. Um, but it's an ideology that doesn't ask you to die for it. You know, if you were a communist, which I, you know, I'm very sympathetic to socialism, but they asked you, you know, to fight for the revolution, give your life for the revolution, but even after the revolution, it wasn't going to be any good until the state withered away. You had to wait. And of course, as we know, the state never managed to do that. So utopia kept being postponed. But we were not able to be happy until we got to utopia, because meantime, things were terrible. That's the way it is with most revolutions. The French Revolution, the immediate aftermath, was the reign of terror. Feminism is a revolution, but it does not ask you to die for it. It asks you to live for it. It asks you to live for it and have pleasure for it. And if you become a feminist, one of the great things about it is, because it tells you to be yourself, that you start to enjoy yourself more the minute you, you join the movement, the minute you start to speak out, the minute you start to be yourself, you're getting more pleasure from life. So feminism is one of those rare movements that improves your life 
right away. You don't have to wait for utopia. Or heaven, even. You can have it right here. Are you doing enough? Of course not. We can never do enough. There's nobody who, who ever does enough because we're trying to undo five, 5,000, maybe longer, years of real cruelty. There is, maybe, I don't know what kind of person you are. I don't know what makes you feel fulfilled. But there is a ne network of feminists, Charlotte Bunch is the most famous, who work globally. They're, they're impoverished. They haven't got two dimes. But Charlotte Bunch goes all over the world. She spends a lot of time in Africa, a lot of time in South America. There are a lot of women who work with her. And they go to strange places, and they try to make people aware of feminism. They deal with the women there who are feminist, teach them techniques so that, for instance, in India, there's a bunch of very beautiful, well-educated young women. In a, there are a whole lot of groups like this. The one I know best is called Sahili. Then these young women finish college. They go out into the countryside. Now, you have no idea what living in the countryside is like until you've done it in India. Uh, the women, for the most part, sit on the ground. The ground is all you share it with cow packs and flies. Uh, the poverty is like something you have never seen, something I have never seen. These young women go out there, they, they may not even speak the dialect, they have to learn it. They live with the women, they work with the women, the women work incredibly hard, the men do almost nothing. And they get the women's trust, and after they have the women's trust, they say, what do you need? What would you like? In one village, the women said, we would like a place to meet. And there is a house, a little house down there we could use, but the men use it for gambling. But they don't use it all the time, only every other week. But the men wouldn't let them use the house. Well, much dickering and much diplomacy and much strategizing, and after a while, they came to some agreement with the men, whereby they let them use the house. And they formed their own cooperative in this house. They met. Then they wanted to make some money because they're so poor. They can't send their children to school because the children need shoes and they need pads and pencils. And the women are too poor to buy these things. The men may have the money, but the men spend it on themselves. Watches, motorcycles, TV sets the women don't have time to watch. So they wanted to start some kind of cooperative, but they couldn't do it because none of them could read or write. So there were a couple of men in the town that could. So they asked the men to be president and secretary of the cooperative. And they did something. I don't remember now what it was they did, whether they bought buffaloes and sold buffalo milk, or whether they did weaving, something. And they worked very hard, but they weren't making any money. And they didn't understand it. So they got the Sahili woman to come in, and she looked things over. And they finally decided there was a woman in a couple towns over who could read and write. And they asked her to come and be their president and secretary, and she did. And it was amazing how the books changed overnight. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, they made a profit. And they had a little money so they could send their kids to school. Well, all right, that's one example. That's one young woman. And that's what she accomplished in this little town. I'm sure she went on to another village. There are women doing this in Africa as well. There are women doing this in often in cities in South America, particularly with regard to rape and battery of women, which is particularly bad in South America, although that's hard to say. It's so bad everywhere. There are things like that you can do if you want to, but you don't have to. There's no, no law saying you must give up your life and go do these things. Live your feminism. Live your life in a way that gives you joy. That's what it's for. have to be the last question. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a very burning question. I was wondering why do the sisters uh, keep on loving their father? Why are they ready to forgive him, uh, you know, until the very last moment? Uh, and uh, do you think if it were sons, would it be the same the other way around to their father, uh, to their mother, I mean? 
I think that we love our parents. I don't think we can help it. Um, I know people who have abandoned their parents. I know one man whose parents, his father was very brutal. And then, excuse me, abandoned the family when this man was quite young. I'll be with you in a minute. Um, my, the, the, the man I knew hated his father, wouldn't have anything to do with him, but in his later years he looked him up, he found him just before he was dying. You can't help loving your parents. A, a child is, is really trapped. You're trapped in love. The parent may not love the child. That is not necessary. Parents can uh, not love children. They can abandon them. But you love the people who raise you in some profound way that doesn't die no matter what they do to you. It's So you don't things. think it's a, a typical feminine? Uh, no, I don't think it's feminine. <laughs> I think it's human. It's human. Um, I think we're more likely to feel that way about our mothers than our fathers because our mothers really raise us. You know, it's the hands-on of yeah. diapers and uh, feedings and hair combing and, and getting you dressed and all of that. But if the father is around a lot, or even if he isn't, you know, then he becomes an invented figure and someone you adore from far off. It's very hard not to love them, even if they're rotten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've read a lot of books by, uh, one of the ways that I wrote this book was to read a lot of accounts of incest by incest survivors because I, I never experienced it so I had to read about it. And what astonished me and sort of upset me about a lot of these accounts was that the women really hated their mothers more than their fathers, really blamed their mothers more than their fathers, even though the father was the one doing it. I, I don't know whether that's part of our general cultural hatred for mothers, because God knows we blame everything on mothers, or whether um, we expect so much of mothers, we expect them to protect us, or whether the mothers, I don't know why that should be, or whether it's just that the mother is the weaker one, she doesn't have the power, it's easier to blame her than to blame the father. I don't know what it is but that happens, or whether it's because it's the one of the same sex. Maybe a son would have an easier time forgiving a mother and hating a father if the father were brutal. I don't know what the reason is, but I put it in the book because I found it in every single account I read. Yes? Don't you think that maybe because the woman, the mother, Stand up. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> God, do I know. <laughs> yes. Could you speak louder? No, I never read that one. I have read Alice Miller, but not that book.
Teresa here. Why not? All good things must come to an end. People have to catch a train. At 10.15 now, tonight, there will be a broadcast, Ursel de Geer program with uh, Miss French, and it is right on in the little foyer. If you wish to stay a while, please do, but other people have to go. Thanks a lot.